Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share Wendigo and Cryptids encounter stories. First story. This story was shared by you slash gabblegabble. I think my mother is using black magic on me. My mother and I have been very close for as long as I can remember. She has always been very sheltering, which you can imagine wasn't all that healthy at times. When I turned 20 and decided to join the army, she tried giving me all possible excuses from the book and alternatives which as she said, were better for my future. When she saw that I was adamant in my decision though, she finally relented. I couldn't stay in the army for too long however and was dismissed during boot camp training due to various health reasons which I had never experienced before, nor after, so I figured it must have been something there which caused me to be sick. Needless to say my mother was more than happy to have me back home, but soon after that I moved out, just like any child does. She was completely okay with that and supportive, however it made her all the more attached to me constantly asking me to come for a visit on the weekends and I would oblige as much as my work would allow me to. But then I met my wife Karen, who lived in a different city. Naturally, we moved in together and due to the flexibility of my own job I was able to move over there. Getting married made my mother very happy, but she did get clingy even more so, especially with the introduction of the Facebook Messenger and other messaging applications. She would incessantly send me messages, which I would eventually start swiping away and ignoring, which she probably figured out, so she would start sending gifts and stickers instead as a reminder. It wasn't just the messaging, but rather the invasive behavior she had. This would include her constant advising about my job, when I should start making children, what I should do with my savings and most of all, incessantly asking when we're going to come visit her. I appreciated her advice, but she was too pushy, so I nicely explained to her that I'm a married adult now with a job and wife and that I can't forever be her little boy. I told her that I needed to live my own life and that while I wanted to continue having contact with her all the time, it was simply not possible due to the time constraint. She agreed and said I was right about everything. However my mother is the kind of person that would nod her head and smile and then continue doing exactly what she was doing before that, completely disregarding what was said. Every now and then I would need to have the, I'm an adult now, speech with my mother, to which she would again agree and back off for a while and then continue badgering me. My wife and I would visit her sometimes, but honestly it became a chore, between the long drive there and the constant repetitive questioning and advice giving I found myself not enjoying my stay there so much anymore. This would get even worse when I would visit alone, since she would be a lot more daring, asking more private questions that she would not ask while my wife was there. But she is my mother after all, so I decided to bite the bullet and endure these minor inconveniences. Life went on for a while and then my mother started having trouble living alone, due to her age. After a very aggravating discussion with my wife, we agreed to let my mother live with us, at least for a while. Although I dreaded living with my mother, my wife absolutely despised the fact, despite agreeing to have her stay. Right from the start, the whole situation only made my marriage worse. My wife was constantly angry at me and would get into fights with my mother. Things weren't easy on me either, and the dread I initially felt was quickly replaced with daily annoyance, as my mother would constantly pry our lives, much more aggressively than before. I would often try to talk to her, but to no avail. She only selectively heard the things that she wanted to hear, even when you outright told her something, dismissing everything else she disagreed with. To make things worse, she's one of those people that would always do so in a polite way, which to me was particularly annoying, since it made it harder for me to be more rudely direct with her. One particular day when I was at work, I got a call from my wife telling me in a very hysterical voice that my mother had slapped her over an argument. 
I quickly got home and asked my mom what was going on, but she just smiled and denied the whole thing, continuing to clean the dishes. When I cornered her about it, she just dismissed the whole thing in a matter-of-factly kind of way, not paying more attention to me now than she did when I was five years old and tried telling her about a movie or video game. I snapped and I slapped her in anger, something I immediately regretted afterwards. After a long discussion with my wife, we decided it was best to put her in a nursing home. Of course my mother was against the whole thing, pleading and begging before starting to curse at us, saying that we'll be miserable without her there. Although it pained me, I knew this was the right thing to do, since I had to choose between my mother and my wife and ultimately I chose the one I liked seeing naked, that means my wife. Now this is when things started getting strange. Not long after putting her in a nursing home, strange things started to happen. Started off as minor inconveniences, burning or cutting myself while cooking or using tools, being late to work due to the heavy traffic and on one occasion even contracting food poisoning from a fast food restaurant. Similar things have been happening to my wife, too. She said she would often break glasses or plates in the kitchen, despite being really careful, her laptop or phone battery would suddenly die and her charger wouldn't work, etc. And on top of that we experienced random power outages almost every week. Calling the superintendent proved fruitless, as he said that no other tenants had complained about power outages. Further inspection by an electrician also proved that there was nothing visibly faulty going on and that we would just have to live with it until they fixed the issue. It gradually just got worse from there, I lost my wallet with all my documents and some money and I was involved in a car crash and the insurance company said they would likely not cover the damage. My wife's PTO was cancelled due to the colossal amount of work they had, so we had to cancel our travel plans. As annoyed as I was, things only got worse from there. I was fired from my job for constantly being late and unproductive and soon after I slipped and broke my leg on the sidewalk. That meant that after my initial recovery in the hospital I would need to stay in bed at home for at least a few more months. To make things worse, my wife has been feeling sick and when she went to the hospital she was diagnosed with cancer. Between me being jobless and with a broken leg and Karen having to go to the hospital on a daily basis there was no way we could make ends meet. Karen asked her sister for help, but she was fighting a battle of her own, so there was no way she could lend us a hand. As much as it pained me, I gave my mother a call and she was more than happy to move in with us. I did specify that it was only temporary, but like I said, my mother was a selective listener and I didn't bother to explain twice. She helped around the house and assisted me whenever I needed it. Her relationship with my wife was better as well and soon things only started improving. I healed and got a new, better job and my wife had somehow miraculously beat her cancer. The doctors were all in awe, they said they'd never seen such a quick recovery, the cancer had practically disappeared overnight. Everything else was falling in place as well. My wallet was recovered which saved me a lot of trouble and money of getting new ID and the insurance company covered the damage on my car from the crash. Life was finally returning to normal. I thanked my mother for everything she did for us and told her that while I appreciate everything, Karen and I needed to work on our marriage and that we needed space for that. Just like last time she started shouting obscenities at us, cursing and calling us ungrateful shits, saying that if we kick her out bad things will happen to us again. I couldn't really stand to argue with her since talking to her was like talking to a wall, so I just placed her back in the nursing home feeling guilty for doing so after all she's done for us. For a while everything was okay, but then things started to happen again. It was like a streak of bad luck every day which only got worse. It started with small things again, objects breaking or getting lost, power outages, etc. 
And then it got more serious. I was almost run over by a truck driver who drove through the red light and I'm sure the only reason I didn't get killed then was because it served as a warning. My wife has been complaining of feeling sick every day that week and I knew right away what that was. To top it all off, things were starting to get nasty at work too, so I knew that it was only a matter of time before I got fired. So, despite my wife's protests I did the only rational thing I could, I told my mother to move in with us again. This time permanently. I expected her to give me a lesson about kicking her out twice before, but instead she just seemed mildly content. In fact by her tone it sounded as if she was already expecting me to call her and tell her this. Almost as soon as she moved in, things started getting back to normal. My job was stabilizing, my wife was no longer feeling sick, I wasn't losing or breaking things inexplicably and no more power outages. My mother is very happy and says we are one big happy family and I smile to her whenever we talk about it, but the truth is, I'm scared for my life. I'm afraid that if I do or say something that might make her angry, the consequences could be dire. A few days ago she and Karen got into a fight and while they were screaming at each other Karen started coughing and feeling sick. I told her to lie down and then gave her a good talk about getting along with my mother. I know it's only a matter of time before Karen leaves me and who knows what might happen when she does. Is she going to die? Or maybe she'll be safe away from me and my mother. All I know is that I can't live like this anymore. She's knocking on my door right now. She baked me some cookies. She's always so thoughtful and caring. I'm truly blessed to have my mother living with me. Second story. This story was shared. By you slash Egint. My great great grandfather married a witch. So this is a story about a woman named Marine who was the second wife of my great great grandfather, she is remembered till today for being a vile, jealous troublemaker who used all sorts of incantations, auguries and curses to hurt and hopefully get rid of people related to her husband's first wife, including siblings, children, children's wives etc. This story took place about 100 years ago in Tirana, Albania, 100 years ago this country was basically still in medieval times, they got water out of wells in every house, people survived by selling basic goods to each other and the few animals they owned. This sets up that the paganistic roots of our people were still very strong, the thousands of beliefs still exist today, at the time they were strong and practiced. So this woman Marine was a skilled paganistic witch or priestess, she knew more about such things than the people around her, she apparently found good inheritance in my great-great-grandfather so she married him, not only that but the dude was in love with her, he always had her side no matter what she did, maybe it was BC she was a tall woman, extremely clean, a perfect house maiden and one of the best cooks around, even my great-grandma and grandma learned by watching her and she is now an absolute master, in the middle of a crowded modern city, in her tiny apartment she does her own bread, yogurt, dried vegetables, pickles, vinegar, cheese, teas, syrups etc., now imagine Marim and what she could do. Now let me tell you the real sinister things this woman is remembered for in my father's side of the family, she really hated the wife of my great-grandfather, her stepson, so she would do all sorts of curses on her so she would leave the house, she do curses of ill health, fights with the head of the family, great-great-grandfather, and more. One of the most wild ones was uncovered and the young bride discovered she had been sleeping with a dried snake in her pillow for the past two, three months. The snake is a famous occult and paganistic symbol in our culture, she would also get nails from her stepson's young bride and tie them up in red strings and throw them all over the house and into the great-great-grandfather's clothes as a symbolism of them fighting and tearing each other apart, lo and behold once over a cup of sugar and her honor.
My great-great-grandfather ordered his first son to get his wife and never return to that house and they never did, they slept in a barn. For years and never returned to that house. They latter cursed the old man that when his mind comes back may he be blinded in real life for being blinded by that woman. Not only did he end up blind for the last decade or so of his life but he also spent almost every day going to his son asking for forgiveness and begging him to return back home with his family. They always refused him mentioning the curse. Another sinister curse Marine did was curse the sister of her husband's first wife, she went to her house and threw some cursed soap, they tell me, to her water well, this was discovered by another good witch they paid to figure it out, she said the thing she threw into the well got dissolved in the water just like your body will, now what happened to the sister was that she one morning couldn't move her legs anymore, she had sensation in her legs, she had feeling but couldn't get up and walk. The doctors couldn't figure it out either, so the good witch did a counter curse that meant the break of the first curse upon the death of its caster. The sister stayed unable to walk for about 15 years until, you guessed it, the death of Marim, two days after her death the sister walked on her all fours and got better with time until she could walk properly. Now I thought I had to share this BC this is a wild history never forgotten in our family. I'd love to hear your thoughts and if you ever had to deal with anything like this. Third story. My brother was the tutor to a brat. Suddenly, the kid's behavior changed. At the time when this incident took place, my brother had just completed his graduation and was looking for a job, preferably a government job. But with the current state of vacancies and intermittent nature of the public service exams, he knew that it would take him at least a year to get the job he wanted. This, added with the financial crunch our family was going through at that time, made my brother desperate to earn some quick money. But as luck would have it, he couldn't find any job that was paying enough to support himself, let alone to support our family. It was at this time, when he was about to lose hope and accept a low-scale job with a meager salary, that an opportunity came to him out of the blue. My brother's former tutor, who loved my brother a lot and was aware of our financial degradation, recommended my brother to the family of one of his students. The student needed a tutor for his arts-based subjects and asked his tutor if he knew anyone good. All my brother needed to do was to meet the family and give a nice impression. In addition to this, the family lived close by, so my brother didn't want to lose this opportunity. Luck seemed to be on my brother's side as he got the job almost immediately. The family seemed very nice and hearty, especially the grandmother, who was a retired bank manager and now lived lavishly on a hefty pension. The only problem was the kid himself. My brother had not seen such a spoiled brat before. Arrogant, horrid, entitled, that kid roamed around like he owned the place, giving orders, throwing fits and behaving rudely with everyone. Apparently, he had some sort of a life-threatening phase up until he's 15 years old, he was 10 at that time, as told by their family astrologer, for which everybody felt hesitant scolding and punishing him for his actions, fearing that maybe it will put his life in danger. And that kid took advantage of this hesitance to the fullest. But for some reason, the kid behaved quite normally in front of my brother, which maybe was one of the primary reasons behind his quick selection. Maybe it was because my brother is almost six feet tall, well built and muscular, so people found him quite intimidating. Anyways, my brother started teaching him the day after his selection. The remuneration was quite handsome so my brother gave it his best and tried not to have any grievances held against him. Plus, the controllable tantrums of that brat made his job pretty smooth. Despite behaving relatively less mischievously around my brother, that kid's behavior around his family was the same if not more than before, as if to compensate for his oppression around my brother. All was going well for a month or two. The kid, 
despite behaving better, didn't do his homework even once. When asked why he doesn't do his homework, he would give the same reply that he doesn't like homework, cause it's boring. This reply would be followed by a cocky smile, which would piss my brother off, but he couldn't do anything to punish him as it was strictly forbidden by the family members. Meanwhile, the kid's demeanor started degrading even further. Now, he found a new way to torture his family members, throwing and kicking away the food, which he didn't like, then abusing his family members and nagging for better food. He did this many times even when my brother was around, my brother could see the anger, pain and frustration reaching its limit in the eyes of his parents. Like, at any moment, the bomb could explode and destroy everything. But it didn't, rather they took it surprisingly well, and fulfilled his every wish. Things began to get strange from this point onwards. The next day, when my brother went to their house for his usual tutoring, he expected the usual carelessness, arrogance and cockiness, but he was surprised to see that the kid was calm, composed and silent. Moreover, he had done his complete homework for the first time in months. Seeing such a sudden and unexpected transformation made my brother curious. He asked the kid if he was sick, but he didn't reply and just continued studying. During the entire class, he didn't even speak once nor exuded any of his usual behavior. Furthermore, he also ate his entire meal, without any complaints and nagging, an oddity considering how he behaved for so many months. Confused, my brother asked his grandmother if something was wrong with him, after the classes got over, she replied that he was given a special medicine called, burnt water, locally known as Jalpra, to keep him calm and turn down his naughtiness a bit. She told my brother not to worry as it is perfectly safe, and just a measure to keep his behavior under control. My brother was skeptical of this so-called medicine but didn't want to drag this topic anymore, so he agreed with her and asked for his leave. As the days passed by, the kid's behavior became stranger and stranger. He completely stopped talking during his tuitions, he even stopped looking up from his book during the entirety of his class. Whenever asked about his health and well-being, he would just nod and continue writing his notes. Another strange thing that my brother noticed was that, the kid stopped calling his grandmother, grandma, as he used to. Now he calls her ma'am. And any time, when his grandmother would tell him to do something, he would immediately leave everything else he was working on at the time, and get his grandmother's orders executed first. My brother now started to feel really creeped out. Something was not right, and he could feel it. How's it possible for a cheerful, mischievous and annoying ten-year-old kid to have such a dramatic change in mere months? Was it really because of that special, Jalpreth medicine? What was it actually made up of? These questions occupied my brother's mind as he was coming back home. He needed to know the answer to these questions and he knew just the person to ask, our grandmother, lovingly called Dida, who was some sort of an expert in ancient medicines and home remedies. If anyone would know what that Jalpareth medicine is, it would be her. So, upon reaching home, he immediately called Dida and told her about his entire experience as well as the questions that were floating around in his mind. What he heard from her, in return, scared him. Burnt water is not a medicine at all, it's a type of black magic, used to control somebody. Chanting certain spells, then blowing your fingertips and dipping them in water, makes the water burnt. This water is deadly if used in excess, but if it is used in proper amounts, it can reap magnificent results in quick time. My brother never went back to that house again. He called the grandmother and told her that he finally got the government job that he desired, which needed him to move to another state, and so he cannot teach the kid anymore. It was a lie, indeed it was, but he felt it was necessary, to protect himself. If she could poison her own flesh and blood, 
what would stop her to someday poison him too? Six years have passed since that terrible incident. My brother now really had a government job, for which he worked hard, day and night. Since the incident occurred such a long time ago, my brother had forgotten most of the technicalities, but he still was careful, not to come face to face or near any member of that family. But fate had other plans it seems, as he saw the grandmother and the kids shopping close to him in the mall one day. He immediately tried to cover his face to not give away his identity, but from a distance, he could see that the kid was again happy and cheerful as before. He was again nagging his grandmother to buy him something by pulling her sari. My brother felt happy, thinking that finally, his grandmother had stopped giving him that medicine. Plus, it has been six years, so that life-threatening phase is also over, therefore, there's no need of that medicine anymore. Feeling relieved, my brother tried to get past them discreetly, when he overheard something which cleared all his doubts. He heard the following conversation. Grandmother, when we get back home, I wish to see you immediately complete all the things that I mentioned before. Fourth story. This story was shared. By you slash B0 Thabacher. Fun with drugs and black magic. Chances are, you walk past something incredible every day and don't notice it. I'm not talking about the obvious beauty of nature, or the intricate plumbing beneath your feet that keeps your shit going in the right direction. I'm talking about things that go bump in the night, and during the day too. Things your parents and the TV told you were myth. But I can tell you with full confidence, most of them are real. In 2014 New Orleans was a city I reluctantly called home. I was an illegal jack of all trades at the time, I sold coke, weed, I arranged escorts of all sexes and sizes for tourists, I pickpocket Texans who got too drunk during Mardi Gras, I did it all. I was lovingly referred to by one of my employers as a walking talking disease. I was quite flattered by this. If you move among the bottom feeders of NOLA, you might find an unusual amount of interest in the occult among your peers. I'm not just talking about voodoo, we had OTO, Freemasons, which, Satanism, Lava Yen and others, you name it. From Chicken Man to an Rice, Nola is full of more boo and woo than you can shake a ceremonial dagger at. At the time I thought it was great fun. If you study the thing you'll very quickly find out why so many three-letter agencies in the government are interested in black magic. For example there is a powder you can blow in someone's face, and if done right, they will do whatever you tell them for a time and have no memory of it. Or kill them, watch your dosage on the elderly. It was my interest in this sort of thing that led me to join what I will refer to as, the Black Lodge. The Black Lodge does not actively recruit, and there are no grades or ranks. The idea was is to push the limits of accepted knowledge about psychology and spirituality, and then record what happens. The problems didn't really start until we began to experiment with the Goetia and psychedelics. You see, many rituals are done with the intent of summoning some sort of entity and then asking it to do things for you. We couldn't scientifically prove the entities exist because we couldn't see them. But this was about to change. We were told by someone I won't identify that there is a tea one can drink that if made properly, will allow one to see spirits and entities. We brewed it, drank it, and began our summoning. We called forth Corinzen. Among all the Thelemic entities we could have produced from the ether this is the most dangerous. Especially to us, for reasons I will explain later. I could waste your time with the foreplay, but I won't. He showed up. Unlike last time we had attempted this however, we could see him. And he could see us. To look at him was sickening. When you say demon most people think of some cheeky little imp that looks like Mr. Tumnus from Narnia. 
Real demons are horrifying. We all saw him differently, I found out later. What I observed was a tall, lanky disgusting humanoid full of spikes and open sores. Its head was cocked at an unnatural angle, and although the face wasn't what you would call a conventional eyes nose and mouth, I could sense it looking at me with a gaze of pure disgust and malice. I felt shame, and ridicule, like I had been caught jacking off or I had a big nose in 1940s Germany. I quickly snapped out of my trance when I saw one member of the group get suddenly dragged away screaming into the darkness. He had been carelessly outside the circle. Even as we heard his pleas for help and his bones snapping and crunching, we dared not leave the circle until the banishing was complete. We later found him dead 20 feet away bent into a disgusting pretzel of a human with his eyes gouged out. We didn't know it at the time, but there was no coming back from here. Fifth Story The Witch Children in the Woods This is a personal story that happened to me a few years ago when I was 26. I've been too scared to talk about it until now out of fear of being made fun of, so here is my story. Call me Sarah. Four years ago, my great-grandmother passed away at the age of 98. We were close all the way into my adult years so the death hit me hard. She lived in a one-story house in a rural town 30 minutes outside of Springfield, Missouri. Her house sat on a large and heavily forested piece of land. There was a large hill several hundred feet behind the house that dropped off into a creek. I spent almost my entire childhood staying on this piece of land and had learned how to take care of it and the house. After the funeral services I volunteered to stay and take care of the land while my family decided on what to do with it. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to buy the land so I wanted to spend as much time out there as I could. My first three days I spent packing up items and cleaning the house. The nearest neighbor was five miles away, so I didn't have to worry about unwanted guests that would get in the way of my packing and disturb my personal way of mourning the loss of someone so close to me. The fourth day is when the odd events started occurring. I slept in a sleeping bag in the living room, and when I woke up I immediately screamed. A few inches away from my face was a dead copperhead snake. It was normal for snakes and other small animals to get in the house, so seeing the snake wasn't surprising, it was the fact that it was so close to my face and it could have bitten me at any moment while I was sleeping. I briefly wondered why the snake had just come in the house and died because there were no physical signs that anything was wrong with it, so I threw it outside and continued with my day and the weird event was almost forgotten. Later that evening I decided to go for a walk through the woods to enjoy the nice weather and reminisce about the good times I'd had in the woods and all the games I used to play. I was walking along an old path that led to a well. The path was narrow and was close to the drop-off that led to the creek. I heard a branch snap behind me and instinctively turned my head. I didn't see anything so I assumed it was an animal and continued walking. Just a few minutes later I heard a snap to my left and turned to look again, but I still didn't see anything. I started to worry that I was being stalked by something, but it was rare to see large animals in this area so I continued walking. I heard a third snap directly in front of me, but now instead of being worried, I was upset. I was convinced that someone else was out here trying to scare me so I shouted at what I assumed to be a person go away. And everything went uncomfortably silent. But I started to hear footsteps approaching in front of me, but I couldn't see anything. They got faster and faster until whoever or whatever it was, was running right at me. I covered my face with my arms and waited to be attacked by some invisible person, but the footsteps stopped. I slowly lowered my arms, but instead of seeing a person, a bobcat, or even a bear, I saw a gigantic spider in the middle of a web I hadn't noticed before. 
If I would have taken one more step I would have ended up being bitten. I turned and ran as fast as I could through the overgrowth and back to the house. I was spooked, but I was out in the middle of the woods and sometimes things like this happened. I knew this land and the house well, so I pushed through the night and the next two days, nothing out of the ordinary happened. I started yard work my second week staying out at the house and it wasn't bad. I'd actually found some old trinkets from my childhood that I'd buried under a tree. While I was picking up fallen branches from a storm the previous night I noticed a clump of hair was caught in one of them. I remember its color being brown and black and considered the possibility of it being a rare encounter with a bear, but there were no tracks that I could see. I brushed it off again, but I was starting to think that maybe someone else was staying on the property and that upset me. I decided to stay up late to see if I could catch the person in the act. Nothing happened until around 2 am. I remember everything so vividly because of how terrified I was. It started with branches crunching and the sound of the wheelbarrow I'd been using earlier falling over. I readied my flashlight and a small knife just in case whoever it was got violent. I heard them step onto the front porch and pull at the screen door, but they quickly abandoned it and instead started walking around the house. I could hear them scraping something sharp against the house and I was furious. I stood up and shined my flashlight at the nearest window that I assumed the person was standing near and shouted at them. I have a weapon. Get off of this property now. Everything stopped and I was positive that whoever it was had left, until I heard something slam against the window so hard I was surprised it didn't break. My flashlight shined on the person and at first I wasn't sure what I was looking at. It had long dark hair with eyes that were way too big for its face. Its skin was wrinkled and reminded me of a naked mole rat. It pressed its face against the glass and fogged it up with its breath. I heard it run around the house several times and bang on every wall, window, and the door every time it passed them. This went on for hours and I was too scared to move or do anything. I was completely alone being tormented by some strange monster. Every now and then I would get the courage to shine my flashlight and caught a glimpse of the thing. Each time I saw it, it looked more animal-like. All I could do was cry and wait for it to go away. Finally, just after sunrise the running and banging stopped, but I didn't dare move until well after 9 am. It took all of my courage to open the front door and see what damage had been done to the house and yard after the terrifying experience from the night before, but there was nothing. No footprints, no scratches against the house or broken or cracked windows. It was almost like I'd imagined the whole thing, but I knew what I saw and had experienced was real. Nothing else happened for the rest of my stay there and by the end of the month my grandfather came to pick me up and take care of the belongings I'd packed away. I was still terrified by what had happened, but I had almost convinced myself that I'd imagined it until my grandfather spoke to me. He told me that he was happy that this land was being sold and how much he hated growing up here. When I asked him why his answer seemed to validate my experience. Now, my grandfather is a serious no-nonsense man. He was the type of person that stayed quiet, but when he did speak you'd better listen because it was important. He was a hardened war veteran and devoted Christian so things like paranormal and supernatural were just fairy tales to him. He made sure to tell his children and me and the rest of my siblings and cousins that. He told me how his mother, my great-grandmother, would always try to scare him and his sister with stories about the land being guarded by monsters. The story says that these monsters, hybrids is what he called them, were the children of falsely accused witches. The people living in the area back when this was going on claimed that the children were part witch and part animal and needed to be killed, so they were left in the forest to die. He said that when the witch children died,
They came back as spirits and claimed the woods as their own and any unwelcome visitors would be tortured until they were literally scared to death. Just how their falsely accused mothers had been scared when they had been killed. My grandfather said he didn't believe in much outside of his religion, but he believed that the hybrids were real and that he had been tormented by one when he tried to go hunting in the woods for the first time and shot his first deer. He believed he had upset the hybrids by killing an innocent animal and never stepped foot on the land with a weapon and they finally left him alone. Maybe this is a foolish thing to believe, but I believe that the story my grandfather told me is true simply because we both had similar terrifying experiences. If I'd had a camera I would have tried to take a picture of the creature or if I could draw I would post a picture of the drawing. I remember every detail about what I saw and will be burned into my memory forever. All of my childhood memories seem tainted now because of this experience and now, I don't think I'm going to miss the land as much as I first thought. It didn't take long for the land and the house to be sold. The hybrids, or whatever it is out there, can be somebody else's nightmare. One night was more than enough for me. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end, subscribe to our channel horror in detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section, and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.